Welcome back to Elections 2017. Before the break, we saw a bit of history of um, Dame Carol Kidu. Uh, Dame Carol, serving your people in the electorate of Moresby South for three consecutive parliamentary term, that's the longest for any female. Um, how did you survive this long and what's, what was your secret of um, keeping this long in, in, in Parliament? I think uh, by working in relationships and by caring about people. Um, as I said before, I was into building people, not buildings. Uh, and um, I hope that the people were appreciating what I was doing. What I was doing was perhaps invisible in the sense of buildings, although I did do some buildings. Mm. But um, it was not invisible in the minds of people mm. because I was training early childhood teachers for in communities. I was having uh, all this done and starting preschools in communities and emphasizing the importance of early childhood. Uh, and the mothers became involved in that. I established the, I worked with David Conn and different people to establish Guinea Goa, the business development foundation, which looked at reaching out to the marginalized in the terms of education. And this was very visible to the people although it might, you know, it, it's not a building with a face on it, which I very much object to. Yeah. Um, it was very much a part of people. And even now, people say thank you mm -hmm. for Guinea Goada. My child is working because of it and things like that, yeah. Okay. Dame Carol, you had pushed for the 22 reserve seats for women in yeah. Parliament, known as the Equality and Participation Bill. Bill. Mm -hmm. Since gaining independence in 1975, Papua New Guinea has only had a handful of women representatives in Parliament. Global research has clearly shown that with more women in Parliament, the social indicators of a nation improve. What was the rationale behind this proposed law? Well, I assumed with limited preferential voting 2007 yeah. that we would see more women come in. Yeah. I had assumed that. And when it ended up that I was there again alone on the floor of Parliament, I thought, well, this is not enough. If you have the great privilege of getting into the Parliament, oh. the men's house, I think we have also have a great responsibility to try to assist other women to be there as well. And so I didn't just try the Equality and Participation Bill. We worked first on the provision within our constitution for nominated seats, went through a very extensive, deep process on calling for expressions of interest, three names, it came down to three names in the end, completely non-political, I didn't get involved at all. It was overseen independently. And in the end, suddenly the opposition pulled the plug on it. We thought they were with it and so they pulled the plug and it didn't happen. Uh, all the meantime, though, I was working on the idea of a larger number of women, and that's the origins of the Equality and Participation Bill. Um, I knew it was an uphill battle. Uh, we hoped we might get there, but it did raise an enormous amount of awareness. We had radio advertisements, we had TV uh, things, we had lots going on. There was a roadshow done by women, mm -hmm. and so it raised the awareness, and I think there was a wave of awareness that there is not happening now. So I'm glad of this program tonight. Um, and although in the end we only passed the constitutional amendment and we didn't get the enabling legislation through, um, it did serve a purpose of raising the thing. I was very disappointed. I hoped PNG would set, set the precedent in the Pacific region, but now Samoa has beaten us to it. Uh, and they have uh, affirmative action and a quota system. Yeah. Okay. And what is your view that... Um the support from the parliament wasn't adequate enough to push the bill through passage. It was a very difficult time, as you remember. There was the the um, the vote that went on, which was later said to be an illegal one, uh, and so parliament was very split. And at the time, Sir Michael Samari's uh, faction were boycotting, so yes. getting the numbers completely was almost impossible task. I'm not convinced that some of the people who were talking commitment were truly committed, um, but it sounded good for them in terms of being with the women. Um, and, you know, it's still there. There's still the provision for an enabling law, whether the same enabling law or another enabling law, uh, looking at what's been done in other parts of the world. But let's see what happens in June this year. If we don't improve the numbers, I think we have to look at things because it's not about a comparison between men and women, it's bringing the voices of both genders into the parliament, because 
uh, people will d bring different perspectives. And I don't want to see women stereotyped to be the Minister for Community Development and looking after women's affairs. Yeah, yeah. It was my passion to be dealing with children, disabled, all of those things. That was my passion. But I want to see a, mini a fem female Minister for Finance suitably qualified, a fem female Minister for Mining, like in South Africa, and or so even on. Or the Prime Minister. Or the Prime Minister, yes, why not? But uh, unfortunately, because I was doing what I was passionate about, um, it kind of, again, stereotyped women in a way, and that is a sad thing. Tell us about your political campaign when you were pushing to get elected. What strategies did you employ? What do you think is what worked for you? I used multiple strategies and I, have a very, I work very hard on a campaign. Um, uh, and I avoided big rallies. I only had them in my base areas, my two main bases, because I'm not convinced they, they win votes, but they show, it's like the warfare, showing, you know, support. But I worked more on uh, smaller gatherings, talking with people and things like that. My final campaign where I had two uh, well-financed men challenging me, I increased my, my strategies and I went to house to house um, in all my base areas. We made bags because I knew money was going out. I made bags and women sewed the bags and we bought other bags and I filled them with bags of knowledge, I call them. And I, we went from house to house with bags of knowledge Go with things inside them about the legislations I'd passed, the committees I was on and all of these things. And um, I think people got a surprise when I won, but I was being very strategic. Three terms in Parliament. Obviously, the first election campaign would have been different from the sec mm -hmm. second and the third term. Yes. How, how, were did, how were they different, being the first and the second and the third? Uh, well, the, the first campaign, I was very fortunate compared with many women. I was a fairly recent widow of a highly respected Papua New Guinean man and so there was that degree of the sympathy vote yeah. and it was from another family within the village, not my own family in the village, another family who approached me and wanted to be the campaign manager mm -hmm. and I've always been grateful and that always remained with that family and I had people from other communities help. But, so that definitely helped me on my first round. Mm -hmm. Um, I did an educational campaign, which was quite different from the normal type of campaigns of men. Um, but I knew that once I had won, and I, I felt fairly convinced I had a good chance. I, I don't do things unless I think I have a reasonable chance. Um, but once I was there, I knew it was then up to me to prove myself and to, um, you know, win the confidence of the people. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were then with the Melanesian Alliance, a... No, I started as an independent and yes. then the political party integrity law yes. uh, came in where we had to join parties. Yes. I'm kind of a very independent lady. Yeah, yeah. But um, then I was with Melanesian Alliance, yes. yes. Okay. So uh, how much um, confidence do you feel political parties have and are willing to invest in women politicians? To be frank, very little. But I think the party system is critical to develop a party system and make it strong. I'd like to see the parties really can seem far more strongly to have women in the party machinery. You know, if they could have 30 to 50 percent of the party membership female and, and working through from there so that the parties take on a gendered, a gender equity approach. Um, I think at present still we'll see this year, but there's been some fairly genuine endorsement, I think, but, in, but not as much as I would like. Then Carol will join us later in the show to talk more about how women can be active in politics outside Parliament. But after the break, are political parties investing more in women candidates?